Hey everyone, this is Robin from Design Hill and your host for the day. I hope you and your family are keeping well and safe. I would like to welcome you for this session where we are going to talk about getting the most out of Google Ads. Today's event is brought to you by Design Hill, world's leading creative marketplace that caters to the creative needs of businesses and individuals alike who can source high quality designs from professional designers and buy unique products created by independent artists. So moving ahead, let me introduce our speaker for today. We have with us Amy Hebden. Amy Hebden is a Google Ads conversion expert and the founder and the managing director of Google partner agency, Paid Search Magic. Since 2004, she has been managing Google Ads for clients ranging from Fortune 10 to SMBs at agencies, in-house and freelancing. Her articles have been published in Search Engine General, Unbounce, PPC Hero, Super Matrix, Copy, Hacker, Copy Hackers and CXL. With her husband, James, she also runs the Facebook group, group Google Ads for Savvy Digital Marketers. Hi, Amy. Would you like to say a quick Hi, everyone. I'm audience? so excited to be here with you. Great. So before we start the session, here is the big announcement. We, were, we are giving away certificates to all the attendees, but for that, you would have to stick till the very end. So brace yourself, guys, and stay tuned till the very end. All right. You need to get your Before parents we start off the session, head to the world's number one creative what marketplace, design, is all about. design Hill. When I started my photography business, I needed something that said, this was more than just a hobby. It's not a hobby, mom. That's why I went to Design Hill and got an amazing logo, super fast, at a price I could afford. The process was easy using Design Hill's logo maker. Just enter the name of your business, then pick out a number of designs that inspire you. I'll pick this one and that one. That one looks cute. Then pick your colors or let the system decide. Add some more info like a slogan, the industry your business is in, and your budget. The logo maker, using machine learning and artificial intelligence, will design thousands of logo variants that you can choose from and adapt. In fact, I was able to get everything from business cards to t-shirt design and complete social media kit, all with the click of a button. With that, I'm all set. Now everyone I meet knows I'm a legit photographer. Even my mom. It's real. That's decaf. Let the world know it's real and build your brand with Design Hill. Let the world know it's real and build your All right, guys, that was all about Design Hill. And now we're all set to start the session. We will take up questions during the session. So if you have anything to ask to Amy, please drop your questions in the questions section on your screen. Amy, over to you now. You can start right. presenting. Thanks so much. Screen. All right, just getting this going here. Bear with me. All right, guys. So as was mentioned, we are going to be talking about getting the most out of Google Ads. So just by way of a quick introduction, I'm Amy Hebden, and I am the founder of Paid Search Magic. I've been doing this, as, as was mentioned, since 2004. Um, so in addition to uh, managing Google Ads for clients, I also get to uh, speak and publish about Google Ads quite a bit. And this is my second time presenting at Design Hill. I'm really excited to be here with you, and I hope you get a lot of value out of this session. This should be really useful for you, whether you're currently managing Google Ads or you've tried to in the past, <laughs> or um, even if you're thinking about taking the leap and you want to make sure you you've got a really good foundation and you really understand what's happening. Um, that's really what the session is designed for. So Paid Search Magic is the agency that I founded in 2017. Um, at that point, I left my job as um, director of paid media at a marketing analytics agency and founded Paid Search Magic. And we help marketing professionals improve their Google ads strategy and results. And the way we do that is through coaching, training, audits, consulting, and full service management. 
So being in the industry really a long time and working really hard to find ways to make accounts successful and then even more successful, always trying to level up, I, I discovered several ingredients to be able to do this successfully time after time. And I'm going to share that with you. This is a framework that I call the Paid Search Magic Framework. And MAGIC is an acronym and it stands for magnetizing your offer so that it's really appealing and attracting um, attractive to the right audience while it kind of repels people who aren't your audience, right? When we're dealing with paid search and we're paying for every click, we want to make sure we're reaching the right people. Then account optimization, doing more of what works and less of what doesn't. Growth strategy to, again, take your results to the next level and make sure you're going in the right direction insights and custom reporting and dashboards so you really understand what's happening and then client success also is a kpi we want to make sure that our clients or um, stakeholders really are happy with how we're performing and what i found and you've probably seen this too is that often when we're talking about google ads we're pretty much focusing exclusively on the a here on account management or optimization and that's important right because google ads can be very confusing um it, there's a lot that changes a lot that um there's a lot to understand there's a lot of data a lot of settings a lot of tools to be familiar with so it makes sense that we kind of focus on that but what i found is that a lot of times we focus exclusively on that and we ignore all the other parts of what will make an account successful and so what happens when we do that when we're only focused on the metrics and these are questions you know like what should my bid strategy be or what attribution model should i be using or you know how many keywords do i have in my ad group like questions like that getting very metrics focused you end up with a local maximum which means that you can optimize and get to the top of the peak but it's really the wrong peak it's not the absolute top of where you could be and so what we want to do is help you get reach the full potential of your account and not just the maximum of the wrong hill. So I want to give you a couple of examples of what we're talking about here. So a metrics first approach could be looking again, that's looking inside the Google ads interface and really getting familiar with all those tools and settings and auction insights and everything that's happening there. But what happens when we're only living in that space? and um, we have a conversion rate on the landing page or for the offer of let's say 3%, which means that 97% of the people who get to the offer say no to the offer, right? That's a lot of people who aren't converting. And if we can get just three more people to say yes to the offer, so 94, uh, 94 out of 100 people are still saying no, but three more say yes, well then we just doubled the performance of everything without even necessarily changing any settings here. So there's a huge growth that can come from that, from focusing on improving the offer. Or if you have a really good suggestion for what might make the account better, but you don't have the soft skills of how to communicate that to your decision maker, and so they just say no, then you're stuck being in this um, local maximum without being able to move forward because you don't necessarily have the skills. So really getting from a metrics first approach to really reaching your full potential, that's not a paint by number system. It's not you follow this step and this step and this step. You have to really understand how everything's working together, which is why using this framework is so important and this is what we're going to be going over today so as I was thinking about what would be the most valuable for the design hill community for us to talk about together I was thinking about a lot of the questions that my consulting clients have when they um, when you know when we get on a call and they're really frustrated you know frustrated enough to to seek me out and and to get me to look at their account so They've um, pulled up their, their account, we're on screen share, and we're looking at their Google Ads interface. And it looks something like this, right? There's all sorts of metrics, all sorts of things they can do. There's probably a lot that they've tried already, and some things worked and some things didn't, and some things worked for a time, and they stopped working. And they're kind of at their wits end. They're not sure how to move forward, how to get better results at this point. And it just feels like there's so much overwhelm here. And you may have experiences too, where you get to the Google Ads interface and you're like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to make heads or tails of this data. It just is, and I don't know how to get any better. So what we're gonna do is we're going to look at a sequence of steps for how we can make some improvements. And again, I want to just reemphasize here that this is about learning how to think strategically. It's not a series of tactics. If you're looking for the answers like 
um, you know, what's the right match type to use in every single case, or what's the right bid strategy to always use, you're going to be disappointed. You're not going to find that here because that isn't how success is won. Success is won through strategy, through investigative thinking, through understanding the systems and those components and how they all work together in order to be able to make those optimizations for your account because they all, everything's going to work a little bit differently. And as you can learn how to think through things strategically, you will see that you're getting better and better results. So what we're going to be talking about today specifically is we're going to look at how to pick the best campaign objective so you really know what it is you're trying to accomplish, like what success looks like. We're going to look at how to get more from your dashboard so you actually know whether you're achieving those goals that you set out to achieve, and then taking things to the next level with keywords and audiences for how you can better target, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. So as you do have questions, as I would say especially if you're new to this, um, there may be some things you're not familiar with because we're not starting out with what is Google Ads, right? We're starting out with how to get more from it. So if you do have questions, please ask, and I'll make sure we can um, get some questions answered in the Q&A. So we're going to start with how to pick the best campaign objectives. And I thought the best way to kick this off was to give you a real life example of what can go wrong if you're not really clear about what your objectives are. So um, at the beginning of the year, I had a um, an audit client. They had hired me to do an audit and they were wondering like what is happening in their account? How come they're seeing fewer and fewer conversions over time? This is not the trend that they wanted to see. So as I started to investigate what was happening here, I mean, you can see that this if, if these were your conversions, you wouldn't be very happy with this trend either, right? I think that's pretty clear. But so I wanted to see what was causing that decline. Like where is where is that decline coming from? What's happening there? So one of the things I did was I segmented the conversions by action type. So there's a lot of different kinds of conversions you can have, and we'll talk about that coming up. But essentially, conversions is not a standardized metric. And what that means is you decide what's valuable for your business, and you, you label that as a conversion. And they had all sorts of conversions from things that were actually um, led to business growth, like, uh, you know, creating, a, signing up for a demo or, or you know, becoming a lead in the, in the customer journey, in the, in the pipeline, all the way to things like page views. Like I think this, um, if I'm remembering right, this blue line right here, this blue uh, in, in the legend, this represents um, like a page view, like something that really didn't matter, like certain you know, clicks and things that didn't drive business growth at all. And so when we look at this and there's, there's, so many um, conversion actions that they had over the years and each thing was being tracked a little bit differently. But so I applied a filter. I said, I only want to see what's happening when we're looking at the, um, the conversions that are actually lead generating. They're actually productive for their business. And when we filtered for that, you see a very different story. Instead of being a downward trend, this is an upward trend where they're, where they're where they are getting better lead generating conversions over time. And this, this is great to be able to tell them, to be able to say, oh, what you think is a decline in performance is actually an improvement. You're getting more valuable leads than you had in the past. These are actual leads and not just, you know, page views or, or clicks or whatever it was that they were tracking. Um, but it can also go the other way where people think, um, you know, hey, we're getting better and better. We're getting more and more conversions. But what they're tracking as conversions is actually something that doesn't really matter. And again, because they're not really clear on their objectives, everything's just being lumped together. Google's counting them all, just giving a sum total, and it ends up being really confusing. And you might be interested to know that this company that we're looking at their performance right now is a publicly traded company. This isn't just a fly-by-night, uh, small little company that hasn't figured out their metrics or marketing yet. This can happen at every single level of any organization if we aren't really paying attention to what it is we're trying to do and how we're measuring success. It's not, it's not a one-off. This happens very, very frequently. And so whether you've been doing Google Ads already or whether you're new to this, this is something really important to be familiar with so you can avoid the same mistake or pitfall if it's, you know, you can keep it from happening or if it's already happened, you can fix it. So 
something important to understand about how um, Google campaigns works is it's, it's a little bit like a deck of cards, which means that you know you can use a, a deck of cards to play a lot of different games. And the rules for each of the games, the objective, like what it takes to win is going to be different. So a winning hand in blackjack is a losing hand at hearts. There's not any um, set in stone standardized rule of like these are good cards or these are bad cards. It really just depends on what game you're playing. So we need to be thinking a few steps forward to say, what game am I trying to play? What does winning look like? What is the objective here? Because if we're not doing that, then the opposite happens. We don't know what we're trying to do. We get like conflicting advice. Maybe our stakeholders are saying, hey, well, what we should be doing is getting more impressions. And they're like, oh, but that's not really going to help the account. And there's just, it becomes kind of a jumbled mess. So you really want to get clear on what game you're playing before you start to try to play the game. That makes sense, right? You don't just have cards and just start dealing them and just look at them and make it up on the fly. You know what game you're playing before you start to play. So when you're creating a new campaign in Google Ads, it'll ask you to define your campaign objective. And the objective could be something like sales and leads, or it could be brand consideration or um, local store visits and promotions. Like there's all sorts of things that you can choose for your campaign objective. You also have um, the option to create a campaign without a goals guidance. Now, when you choose one of these goals, uh, it will affect what campaign types are available to, for you to use. It will also affect what features are available or aren't available based on that. So you do want to make sure you're being cautious with this and that you are choosing a campaign objective that really reflects what it is that you're trying to accomplish. You're also going to need to define your conversion actions. And like we talked about just a little bit earlier, conversions aren't a standardized metric. So anything that you define as being important to your business, you can enter in here. You can um, use tracking code from your website. You can import, you can track actions on your app. You can track phone calls as conversions if that's what's important to your business. Or you can import your goals directly from Google Analytics or from offline data. There's a lot of ways you can get conversions into the system. System, but what happens is that Google looks at everything that's a conversion and essentially rolls it up and says, this is what's important to you. So it's up to you to say this is more important or less important or give it a different value or look at it differently. But if you don't take those steps, whatever those steps are, if you're not taking those steps to say this is a valuable conversion or this is something we want to track, but it's actually not something we're trying to optimize for. If you're not doing that, then you're going to end up in the situation where um, everything's just blended together. And again, you don't have a really clear idea on what's working and what's not to drive your um, the, the growth of your business. So conversions don't all have the same value. If you're looking at, you know, transaction, um, you know, the value of selling some candy has a very low conversion value. The value of selling a house obviously has a much higher conversion value. The problem that we can run into is if we're just looking at, well, how much did it cost to acquire a conversion? If we're, if our the value of a conversion is much less, we want to make sure that our target cost for a conversion is much less, right? We don't want to say just a blanket, you know, $40 for a conversion because $40 for a conversion, we would lose money on selling the candy and make so much money on the house that we would really want to probably set a higher CPA cost per conversion than or cost per action than that $40. So this is a lot more nuanced, right? There's not a good CPA uh, cost per action and a bad CPA. It really depends on what it is we're selling, you know, what, what again, the value is to the business. You always want to be thinking about what's the value here and not just trying to find some like standardized metric here. So your key performance indicators or KPIs should drive business growth. That's one thing we talked about already, right? And then be trackable as conversions. Sometimes people will want to launch something they actually can't track. So for instance, like, well, I'll know that the campaign's performing well if my phone's ringing in my office. They're not tracking it at all. That becomes really hard for you as the marketer to know what's working and what's not. So you want to make sure that what you're um, what you're optimizing for, your key performance indicator, is something you actually can measure and track. Then you also want to make sure that it matches the customer journey. Um, because while Google Ads is really good for getting that bottom of the funnel traffic where people are ready to buy, there's also a lot of benefits for showing up earlier in the funnel. And we want to make sure we've got appropriate KPIs to measure the success 
of those campaigns and that we're looking at it differently. So basically, your account is an ecosystem, and each campaign has its own role in the ecosystem. And so you want to be mindful of the contribution of different types of campaigns. So I mentioned a little bit earlier about how the objective that you choose will affect the campaign type. So initially, when Google Ads first started, back when it was AdWords, we were really only focused on search campaigns, right? That was that was what AdWords was, was words <laughs> that we were bidding on on Google.com. But it's really um, grown and will continue to grow. So we have so many more options. Um, and we'll be looking at some of, you know, just the different value of showing up in different capacities. But if if you run a smart campaign or a discovery campaign, that's not gonna perform the same way that search does, just because it's, it's uh, reaching someone differently in the funnel. So campaigns can have different types, like we were just looking at. You could have search or video or shopping or display. Um, you can be on different networks. So there's you could be on Google.com or Google owned and operated properties like Discovery or Gmail or the Google Display Network or YouTube. You're also going to have different bid strategies for your campaigns because they have different values to you. So you could have uh, conversions. You could be optimizing for conversion value or CPC or um, impression share. There's a lot you can do with bid strategies. And I'm just kind of giving you an overview here so you can see Again, there's not one right and one wrong way, but you do want to have an ecosystem. You want to have things that are high level and you know lower in the funnel. And then goals, like you could have a cam one campaign that you expect to be really efficient and give you, um, or I guess that it's going to have a high CPA, or you could have one that has a lower CPA. So all these things can exist concurrently inside your account. And then also each campaign can have different daily budgets. And some campaigns are going to be more efficient and some campaigns are going to be better at driving volume. And these are all going to live together at the same time. And we mentioned a little bit about the funnel and, and what you want to be mindful of for that, which is that not every, um, not every campaign is going to be able to be a bottom of the funnel sort of decider with a really high conversion rate, right? Some things are going to be more to like get people into the funnel than they are to close people in the funnel. And you want your account to be able to allow for all of that. So let's look at really where the rubber hits the road. And this is something that I have, you know, it's very, very common for consulting clients um, who are stuck to have questions like this. So we're going to go over together what this might look like so you can get an idea of how to think about this and, and what you might want to do differently. So let's imagine that we had a goal for the account. We want to hit a seven to one ROAS, which means for every dollar that we're spending, we're on ads, we're making seven dollars back in in value and obviously not not all accounts are going to be measuring return right not everything is e-commerce there's a lot of other ways to do it but just using this as an example if we had a target of seven ROAS so the account is ultimately all in it's hitting um, above it's coming in above a seven but we have a few campaigns that aren't hitting that goal and my experience is that for marketers who are a little bit uncomfortable, like you don't know where to go, you're, what you're, one of the things that's confusing is, well, how do I optimize each of these? Because sales performance max, this campaign right here, isn't hitting the seven. So should I turn it off because it's not working? Um, and then we have a branded search campaign that's doing very well, that's exceeding the target, but there's not much more room for growth, right? The click share is already at 99%, so there's not a lot we can do with that. And then we have awareness or discovery campaign, which is doing far below th that target of seven. So how do we move forward with this? Now, if you don't have objectives for your campaigns, if everything's just like, well, everything needs to hit the seven, um, the you know target of seven ROAS, you might be tempted to go in and pause this top campaign and pause this bottom campaign and only leave branded search on and what will that do it'll improve your overall return on ad spend but it's going to cost you a lot of additional conversions and new customers and new clients that you could potentially be getting so we don't want to hold um our our awareness campaigns that you know, the higher in the funnel to that same efficiency goal that we would expect bottom of the funnel. So when we're looking at brand or remarketing or really high intent keywords, it's great. You know, they they can outperform 
our overall account goal, but that also gives us room to have some campaigns, especially in the higher in the funnel, underperform, that we're not going to hold them to the same expectations of um, how they're going to net out for us, right? So it's perfectly fine to have a campaign. Here we have 6.4 uh, ROAS, not hit the seven, and still not only leave it on, but even potentially optimize it, or excuse me, expand it, so we can get even more volume, because there's a lot of potential click share that it's not getting, and we have more room to go to get more volume before we start running into um, a situation where we might be get you know, getting lower than our target ROAS. So if you have questions about this, be sure to ask them in the q and I'm happy to explain this more, but hopefully this is making some sense that we're going to be evaluating the performance of our campaigns individually based on their individual objective and not just one group of, you know, like let's pause everything that's not hitting this return because there are going to be some campaigns that are more efficient and some that are less efficient. So one thing that I found to be helpful is to create a, a matrix to say, hey, you know, when when we're trying to accomplish, um, we're, you know, we're trying to come in, here's the overall objective for the account, but these kinds of campaigns, we're going to hold to a, you know, a different goal, different metric than these other kinds of campaigns. I and mean, so we kind of create a matrix so we can look at them and say, like, is this type of campaign hitting the goal? And where I started doing this was years ago, um, where I had a, a campaign that was really, really good at efficiency, but because we were so efficient, we kind of lost the opportunity to be doing a lot of awareness campaigns. Um, a lot of, you know, video and higher level, um, higher in the funnel campaigns, because if we were to do that, what would that do? That would make our campaigns a little bit less efficient. So our ROAS would go down, but our client really wanted to be in those spaces. We're like, okay, we can, but if we do that, then it's not going to look as good um, on, on the, you know, on the bottom line because you're going to lose some efficiency for getting that higher volume. So what we did is we started to say, hey, you know what, these kinds of campaigns, as long as we're hitting, you know, this 50 ROAS and that's fine. And these other kinds of campaigns, we're just going to hit a two to one or our goal is to get, um, you know, new subscribers or whatever. It's not even a monetary goal. And by having a matrix where we had individual goals for different campaign objectives, that really helped us to be able to kind of create a framework and a structure where we could hold uh, each different campaign type accountable. Now, you don't have to create something exactly like this. Um, and if this feels overwhelming, uh, that's fine. It's It's not this is not the essential thing. But what is essential is that you want to make sure that you're you have different objectives for your campaigns that can answer, you know, what are we trying to do with this campaign? Because as you saw, when you know what you're trying to do, it becomes really easy to tell if you're doing it or not. <laughs> if you don't know what you're trying to do, then everything is just kind of up in the air and it's really confusing. So you also want to be able to say, how are we how can we tell if we're doing it? So what what is our KPI? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Um, you know, we have our what it is we're looking at as a success metric and then you know there's going to be another sort of volume goal or maybe volume is the first uh the primary thing we're looking at for that metric and then when we have both of those figured out that informs what we should do next so your campaign objective won't tell you what to do next but when you compare actual performance with the campaign objective then you'll start to get a good idea of how to go forward so one other hiccup that i see happen a lot when we're looking at campaign objectives is that Google has its own agenda of what it wants to do, like what its objectives are for you, for your campaigns. And a lot of times people are like, ah, you know, Google says I should do this, should I? And they're kind of looking for, again, this yes or no answer, like always listen to Google or never listen to Google. And it's not like that. Because if you know your campaign objectives, then you can look at their the recommendations that Google offers within the account and you can say, will this help me meet my objective? And if it does, then by all means, like take the opportunity to, to um, implement that recommendation and it can just help take you further. But if it doesn't, then you don't have to do it and you don't have to feel bad about it. You know, one, um, one example that I see quite a bit is that Google will say, hey, you know, you should turn on location extensions. Okay, but if you're not a brick and mortar, if you don't have locations, like if people don't go to your headquarters to buy something, that doesn't make any sense for that particular account or that campaign. It doesn't mean that location extensions are bad, but it's not right for you. And so as you know how to make decisions about your campaign objectives, then this can help you decide whether or not to implement Google recommendations recommendations or not. And it's a lot easier than just feeling like, you know, <laughs> just feeling lost because you're not quite sure how to evaluate those criteria. 
Now let's talk about how to get more from your dashboards. And so I want you to imagine that you are um, in this high school, in Beverly Hills High School, where this assignment was given. So the, the prompt is to write the lead for this story. And so again, this is student journalism, uh, and your, your audience is a student body, and this is the prompt. Kenneth L. Peters, the principal of Beverly Hills High School, announced today that the entire school high school faculty will travel to Sacramento next Thursday for a colloquium in new teaching methods. Among the speakers will be anthropologist Margaret Mead, college president Dr. Robert Maynard Hutchins, and California Governor Edmund Pat Brown. So having all these different facts, you've got the who, where, when, all all this information, what's the most important part of that? What's the headline? Well, this um, scenario is, is a true story <laughs> that um, it's actually Nora Ephron shared that this was um, one of her earlier experiences in journalism. So she, Nora Ephron wrote um, mo a lot of movies like Sleepless in Seattle, and she's also a um, a very successful journalist. And she said that when she was in high school, they got this prompt and they everyone kind of was trying to figure out, well, maybe Margaret Mead is the most important part of this, you know, this lead because uh, she's the most famous. And, you know, they're trying to decide what, what would be the headline. And everyone submitted their headlines and their teacher told them that all of them were wrong because he said that the actual headline is there will be no school next Thursday. So the prompt itself didn't actually mention that, but you could infer by putting those together that that's actually the, like not only what was gonna be happening, but that was the most important thing. That was what the student body needed to know. And Nora Ephron said in response to this, she said, in that instant, I realized that journalism was not just about regurgitating the facts, but about figuring out the point. It wasn't enough to know the who, what, where, and who, what, when, and where. You had to understand what it meant and why it mattered. And I think that's a really important um it's a really important point. And it's really analogous to what happens in Google Ads dashboards like every single day. Because when you look at this and you're just like, there's so much information, like Google is not doing a really great job of telling you exactly what the point is, right? It's kind of making you figure it out and it's really confusing. So if you're confused, I mean, is that by design? I don't know. I I, I don't know why this is um, as, <laughs> as not user friendly and helpful as I think it probably could be. But the point is that there's steps you can take to arrange your dashboards differently. So they do help to tell a story, help you figure out like really what matters in all of this. So we're going to go through um, and a, a few different things you can do to improve your dashboards. And one of the first ones is overview summary cards. Because when I'm looking at a lot of you know, my consulting clients, they just, they, they've left the default settings as they are. And this is not really useful. We talked about KPIs, what you're, what it is you're trying to accomplish, you're probably not trying to accomplish clicks and impressions because those don't actually grow your business. Those are kind of secondary to what it actually is that grows your business. And so there's no reason to leave it like this. You can actually edit your um, your overview summary cards to feature your most important metrics. Just click on this little drop down, and you can change the metric that it shows by toggling, um, by clicking on or off of um, these different cards. You can add them to your uh, time series chart or not. Um, and then you can actually change over here which, what kind of like how you, um, there's some different options for how you can show this. So you, just, you can show on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly sort of basis, depending on what your time range is. But changing this is going to give you a much better idea and an overview, like what is the ROAS we're hitting? You know, knowing that is going to be a lot more powerful than what your clicks are. Like, what, how much, uh, what's the conversion value we're coming in, or how many conversions? All those things are really going to help you out, but you need to actually change the settings to get there. Now, time period is another area that can be really useful in better understanding your dashboards. And I don't think I'm revealing a big secret to say, hey, there's a there's a time uh, control. But a lot of times when people are looking inside their, like at their columns or in their tables, they just, they're so confused by it, they're not paying attention to the fact you can change the date range. And that can be really helpful. Um, 
I'm not exaggerating to say it is very common for people to say, oh, my conversions are down. And then I say, okay, well, let's expand the, the time series that we're looking at, the time period, so we can see how conversions are performing. And when we do that, they're actually up. But somewhere this narrative came up that things are down. And so then that's what people decided is true. But when we actually look at the data, we can validate whether or not that's true or not really easily. We can also compare to a previous period, whether that's a previous month or previous uh, seven days or previous year. Um, you're going to do that down here where it says compare. You can set that up so you can, you know, if you're trying to say year over year or month over month, you can see that really easily. But this is really going to be able to help you, um, you know, validate those assumptions and give you a better context of how really what's happening. So within your, um, within your statistics table, you're also going to adjust the columns. Because if you're looking at something like this and you're just overwhelmed by all this data, well, I don't blame you at all for being overwhelmed because it's really hard to tell what's supposed to happen next. So the way you're going to get better data from here to really understand the point of, you know, the whole story of what's happening is you're going to go to columns over, it's just right on top of your table towards the right. And you're going to go to modify columns. And then you have all these different um, columns that you can add in. So you can select anything you want. You can even add custom columns. And then you can drag and drop so that the most important columns are right over there on the left. So in English, we read left to right. So that we expect what's most important to be on the left. It's going to really help you to, um, to set your columns up in a similar manner. So here, Instead of just having all this data, we have conversions, conversion rate, and cost per conversion right at the front. And then I've sorted this by conversions, and you can sort any of these metrics, um, you know, top to bottom or, or least to greatest. You can choose how you do that. And then these little brackets you can actually expand out, and that'll help you compare. This is comparing to a time period. You can expand out, and it'll give you more details about how it's performing. So if we were to, um, to look at this performance just based on changing the columns around, now I know which, my, um, which campaign has been you know, the best driver of conversions. I can see it's up. 40%, but that my cost is up 70%. So I can make a decision about like, was it worth it? Should I continue, you know, should I make a change because I'm spending more? Is that valuable for me or not? Whereas this next highest converting campaign is up 90% and I actually spent less. So that looks like it's working really well. So I can start to dig in and look for improvements. But I, I couldn't tell this when I was just looking at random data, right? That didn't tell me anything. Like I need to be able to um, curate it and establish a hierarchy. So for columns, you want to add and edit them to include KPIs, sort by priority, compare date ranges. You can create custom columns as needed and then also save your column set so you can continue to apply it without having to uh, redo that. Now, filters are going to narrow the focus for you. So you can, um, in your statistic table, go up here to a filter. There's all sorts of things you can choose from. And if you're not familiar with this, I recommend just taking some time and getting familiar with it. Like, look and see what might be useful for you. Some filters that I use that are helpful for me are things like campaign name, keyword text, search terms, performance, and labels. So performance would be like if I want to say, like, what spent less than $50 or which of all my campaigns or keywords, you know, didn't have this click-through rate or whatever. And I can just start looking at that to really focus on, you know, what the, a specific question I'm trying to answer. Now, segments are going to basically do the opposite. They're going to expand the data. So here we have, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning with conversions. So this account had 358 conversions in this time period. But then I went ahead and created a segment so I could see, well, what are the conversion actions that are happening? And when I did that, I saw that only 13 of all these conversions were actually book a demo, that the rest of them were something that was less important, like a page view. These were being automatically, the, this client was running a smart campaign and um, getting a lot of conversions that he assumed were uh, demos, but they actually were not. Um, so this is really useful information to be able to say like, hey, this actually isn't performing the way you expected we're seeing something else. And that's what we can do when we segment the data. So the data is there, but you have to know how to access it. Um, so the way you're going to do that is by going up to segment, and then you can choose among the segments. In this case, it was conversion action. But again, if this is something you're not familiar with, spend some time to get familiar with it. And it'll really help you get more from your dashboards. So you want to edit your dashboards to reflect your KPIs establish hierarchy and really get to the point of what it is, right? You want to get to the no school on Thursday point, not all the facts that are just, you know, not as useful. So finally, we're going to look at keywords 
and the audiences for better targeting. And I think I'm kind of running close to time here, so we're going to go through this a little bit quickly. But you want to look at if you're trying to narrow or expand your reach with what you're doing for targeting your keywords and audiences. Now, keywords are the bread and butter for Google, right? This is where they really got started with advertising in the first place, that you enter your keywords in, and those are what that's what triggers your ads. You really want to optimize for intent, meaning you want to make sure you've got your high intent keywords all together in the same uh, ad groups and campaigns. And you want to start really with here where, you know, someone's ready to buy as opposed to, you know, they're not even thinking about buying. Now, for some reason, people tend to counter, <laughs> it, it doesn't work very well, but they tend to think about like cold first because like where, where is someone that, you know, I'll, I'll have no competition or there's a lot more volume. That's not what you want to do. If you're spending money for those clicks, you want to make sure that they're very likely to take action on your offer. Now, the stage of awareness um, for, for keywords, if you're familiar with the idea of stages of awareness where people could be, you know, they're, they're problem aware, but they don't really even know about a solution yet, all the way to most aware that they're ready to buy from you. The goal, there's not nearly as many people who are ready to buy as there are just that exist in the you know total addressable market in the universe. But you do want to make sure that you've got really good coverage for um, for the the keywords that are high intent. And then you can kind of, you can, hopefully this is starting to make sense that with your campaign objectives and your campaign structure, that you could also have a supporting campaign that, you know, supports those high volume, low intent keywords, but you're going to have different goals for that. You're going to have a different budget for that. And you're not going to prioritize it as much as you do those high priority keywords for you. Now, here's an example, and this might be a good one to screenshot if you're into screenshotting, um, to just, you know, again, applying the stages of awareness to how you might set up, uh, think, you know, think through your keywords that for, for your brand name and for where there's already familiarity, you're just trying to protect it from competitors because you could potentially win that click either way, even just through organic. But um, for you want to win the click where someone's like ready to buy and isn't as familiar with you and then towards the other end of the spectrum where there's just where people aren't ready to buy at all um they're not, they're not even familiar with the solution you'd want to protect your budget so you're not wasting all your budget on clicks that aren't ready to convert now audiences is a little bit different audiences google has really been leaning into because there's a lot more opportunity for google right google is also a business that's trying to grow and it, one of the ways it grows is by getting more clicks it can charge more for clicks and it can get more clicks and people are more likely to be anywhere online than they are to be searching google to solve this particular problem where google's only going to show a, a couple of ads right above the fold so this is really important for google to be able to expand and so when it comes to how you market you want to be making sure you're really refining and narrowing who sees this because you don't want to be everywhere. Uh, running on non-Google properties or on non-search campaigns is a little bit different on Google than it is for like say Facebook or Instagram where there's you're able to like really capture someone's attention. Instead like someone could be reading an article on how to fix their sink and if your ad shows up there that's not going to work nearly as well as it would if you're like actually in the scroll for Facebook, right? So you want to think about it a little bit differently. So we do have some really good options for uh, audience targeting. So who they are, this could be detailed demographics. Um, and we we have, a, there's a lot of options now. It could be someone who moved recently, someone who's, you know, ready to graduate college. There's all sorts of things you can do um, for what their interests and habits are, what they're actively searching. This could be based on, um, you know, searches that they have done in Google, and then you show up later with a um, that your display or discovery ad, then how they've interacted with your business, like remarketing, um, that sort of thing, or similar audiences. One uh, way I really like to use audiences is by creating uh, essentially a profile. This is not remarketing. I want to make sure this is really clear. This is not remarketing to people who we haven't uh, cookied. But what this is is saying, hey, the kinds of people who are visiting, say, Boca Burger and uh Beyond Meat and Morningstar Farms, those kinds of people. I want to make sure that I'm serving my ad to those kinds of people and I can, you know, create a segment for that and run my ads against that segment. So I can be choosy about the content and I can be choosy about the audiences and I can uh, customize my audiences. And it's a really good way to get in front of the right people, um, which is another way to um, just to make sure if you're running on display or discovery that you're reaching the right audiences. 
You can also apply audience targeting to search campaigns. Uh, in this case, this is an example of where the keyword had to do with like, hard money loans. But are we trying to reach the lender or the borrower? Well, we can make some adjustments. You know, so people who are investors, well, we're going to increase a bit, and people who are looking for personal loans, we're going to decrease a bit, or we could turn it off entirely. And this is how we can use audiences to even refine our keywords. Um, ultimately, with Google Ads, you can put your best offer in front of your ideal audience when they're most ready to take action. This is what I like to tell people, like the, really the power of Google Ads is, is you get to do that. Um, and so by using campaign objectives, that shows you really where to go. Uh, dashboards will show you if you're on the right track when you can, um, again, curate your dashboards to really help tell a story. And then keywords and audiences help you get there. So that is the presentation that I wanted to share with you that was really going to help you out, um, you know, as, as you're getting started. And we're, I think we're ready to open up for Q&A. Great, great, Amy. Thanks for the amazing presentation. I hope uh, everyone in the audience really learned from this valuable insights that Amy provided. So Amy, let's quickly come to the questions. So at the moment, we have two questions uh, in the question section. So I can see it's from the first question is from Nicholas is asking, uh, I have heard about upcoming changes in Google Ads interface and platform. I think uh, he wants to know if you have any information about uh, any changes that will be coming soon in Google Ads interface or platform. I mean, I can't think of a time where there's not upcoming changes um, to the interface and platform. There, there always are. I think that right now, kind of, I mean, so currently we're in the process of um, local campaigns and uh, smart shopping campaigns to be switched over to Performance Max. So that's happening right now. Um, I think that there's kind of chatter about moving more towards smart campaigns entirely, um, but there's nothing on the horizon that that I'm aware of that would take away um, any other any other campaign types we have. So I, I would love I would love to know if there's anything more specific that you've heard about. Um, you know, I, I don't work at Google. I don't have any inside knowledge that I'm able to publicly share that Google wouldn't have shared already. But yeah, there there always are changes that that's just kind of how the games play that Google is constantly changing what's available. Great, great. So I hope Nicholas Nicholas this answers your question. And if you want to ask any specific uh, information regarding uh, any interface tool or platform, just uh, uh, type in here. So next question, Amy, we have from Rahul. Uh, he's asking, uh, Google Ads is only beneficial when you have your own website. So he's asking um, if you have one website, then only the ads process is uh, beneficial for you. Yeah, and that that's not necessarily true. I would say that if if you were going to ask, like, is it better to have your own website? Probably it is. Um, and the reason for that is that Google is only going to be running one ad per domain. And so if you're, let's say you're promoting an event and you're using Eventbrite, there's only going to be one ad that's available to run for Eventbrite. And there's a lot of different, um, a, a lot of different companies or product or you know events that might be running from there. So if we're talking about the standard um, search ads, we're only going to see one one thing. So that could be from you or from someone else, and so it kind of affects uh, competition that way. Now I will say that if we're if we're talking about shopping, then there could be multiple listings running at the same time. And you've probably seen that where there's several different products run by the same company. Um, so it's not quite the same rules there. But ultimately, you know, if you if you can run things from your own website, there's more upside for you because you're probably not sharing the margins as opposed to if you're on a marketplace where you are. And a lot of times marketplace will have rules about whether you can bid on their brand, you know, what, what you can and can't use um, for like, I, I don't know if you're a, a, a reseller or um, like joint venture sorts of things, there's going to be a lot of limitations on that. So you do just want to make sure you know the restrictions of whatever program it is you're using if it's not your website. Um, so yeah, it, so there, there are use cases for it. But overall, if you're trying to get like the most value, having your website is probably going to be the way to go if you have that option. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful, Emmy. Thank you for answering that. 
Uh, I think we have two questions and the question screen, but I can see one question in the chat section from Mario. He wants to know if uh, you can give an example of uh, using the keywords. An example us, of, yeah. of the use of keywords. Okay. Yeah. So like, let's say that, um, let's say I was advertising for, I was trying to sell uh, Mazdas from the 1980s. So if I really wanted to get high intent, I could bid on a keyword like, buy a used Mazda from 1980, right? That could be a high intent keyword. A less high intent keyword that's gonna be a lot more broad would be cars for sale. Because someone who's looking for cars for sale could be looking for a Tesla. They could be looking for any sort of sports car. They could be looking for new cars. They could be looking at Hondas or, or all sorts of things. So cars for sale is, even though it's in the same category, because someone who's looking for cars for sale you know, Mazda is a car for sale, but if I'm selling 1980s Mazdas, then cars for sale is not going to be very valuable. Now, there are other factors in how to use keywords other than just thinking about the keyword. We're also going to, um, you're probably familiar with match types also. So match types, if I say I only want to bid on like the exact term, 1980s Mazdas for sale, then that's going to further refine or narrow who sees my ad as opposed to if I just do broad match and google's really pushing broad match right now for keywords they're kind of saying hey yeah it used to not work very well but now it works well and i would take that with a grain of salt um i've seen campaigns i've seen accounts where they're there actually is some truth to that, that you actually can get pretty good performance that Google will pretty much match um, traffic. You know, what people are actually typing into Google, that will pretty much match your keyword. But there's also cases where it's really, really far removed from that. And so you do want to pay attention to how your match types are working. And you can go into search term data and see what the queries are that people are actually typing in. Um, and you can see how closely that matches your keyword. And that can help to inform the match types that you choose, whether you choose to do broad uh, phrase or exact match. Does, does that help? Yes, yes, Amy. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining it so well. So I think uh, that's all in the questions. So all right. So this brings us to the end of this wonderful workshop with you, Amy. And this was indeed a value packed session. Although there is a lot more that we could have learned. Unfortunately, we are limited by time here. And I hope you guys loved this session because I personally did. And once again, I would like to thank you, Amy, for taking out time and so early. So it's uh, eight, uh, it's 9 a.m., about 9 a.m. at Amy's time. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you all of you for joining this session. And uh, this is not where it ends, guys. We have a lot more events lined up for you. So don't forget to check out our events page. And to watch this session and other such wonderful sessions, subscribe to our official YouTube channel. And you can find the link in the chat section. For all the designers and artists who are listening to this and wish to be a part of thriving design community, visit designhill.com. And on that note, I would like to say bye to everyone who joined us here today. Take care, guys, and stay safe.